All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the webinar on Are You Developing a New Product? Let's Make It Safe. My name is Dolores Serafin, and I work for Alberta Agriculture, Forestry, and Rural Economic Development with the Food and Bioprocessing Branch. I will be your host for today's webinar. During this one hour webinar, you will learn how food labeling and safety testing can be incorporated into the, develop, into the product development process. An inspector from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency will discuss the changes to the labeling requirements, format to nutrition fact tables, the do's and don'ts of making product claims and more. Our lab scientists from the Leduc Food Processing Development Center will provide an overview on some basic food safety testing, pH, water activity, et cetera, that food processors can use to focus on the safety in addition to the quality of their products. Before we start though, here are a few housekeeping items. If you would like to ask a question, please click on the Q&A symbol at the top of your screen. I will make sure that our presenters address all of the questions at the end of the presentation. The webinar is being recorded for your viewing pleasure later. The link will be sent to you in an email after the live webinar. Our webinar today is scheduled for 60 minutes. We are anticipating approximately 45 minutes of presentation time and 15 minutes for questions at the end. Our presenters today are Carol Thompson with the Canada Food Inspection Agency and Stuart Johnson with Alberta Agriculture, Forestry and Rural Economic Development. Carol has spent the last 14 years in the labeling program with CFIA, working with the different levels of trade. She started her career in 1989 with Agriculture Canada. Over the years, the name has changed and the programs and regulations have evolved. Her favorite group to work with is the farmers market vendors. Second would be taking the time to teach and show the grade four kids in Red Deer how to read a food label and make butter. Stuart Johnson has worked with the Food Processing Development Center in the areas of food analysis and product process development since 2012. He has worked with food companies, industry groups, associations and academia in Alberta and across Canada to develop value-added products and processes in a variety of commodity areas. Recently, his focus has been on alternative protein extraction and linking protein functionality with specific food product applications. I will now hand it over to Carol and Stuart to uh, share all their knowledge. Thank you, and hello everyone. And thank you to Eileen and uh, the rest of the group for, for the invite. So you can see my presentation today. We're going to be talking a little bit about food labeling with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and Health Canada. So my overview, acts and regulations, I won't spend a lot of time on that. Health Canada's labeling changes, industry labeling tool, some claims and statements, licensing, who is that? Traceability with some new regulations. <laughs> As I mentioned, we won't uh, spend a lot of time on the regulations, but most of you are probably aware that the Food and Drug Act and Regulations oversee all labeling for food products in uh, sold in Canada, whether it's imported, made domestically. So those are just some of the uh, items listed there that the regulations contain. And if the others are aware, Safe Food for Canadians Act and Regulations are new. They came in uh, into force in 2019. So these regulations took over the other uh, CAP uh, Canadian agriculture products. If you're in the egg program or you sell honey with a grade, they encompassed all these uh, all these other acts and regulations to uh, to this new group, which is the Safe Food for Canadians Act and Regulations. I included a link for you both or for everyone to uh, to be able to find those regulations. Off the, uh, off the CFIA website there. So Health Canada, they are the group that uh, makes the regulations, they make policy, make the changes, and the CFIA, we enforce those changes. So if you're aware, five years ago, I guess it's six now, in uh, 2016, Health Canada decided to change the uh, 
some of the the nutrition facts table, nutrient contents, um, how you do your list of ingredients, how you declare sugars now, and the serving sizes. At the bottom there, I also included the link to these changes. So the five-year uh, implementation time was supposed to have been December of 2021, but with COVID, the government um, gave a one-year extension. So here are a few of the changes. I really like this, um, that last uh, um, website to go to because it does show you the original and the new. And it goes into great detail for the sugars, for your uh, serving sizes. Um, I really like this, this table. So I took, uh, I took this snapshot and this shows you what the old, I call it old, uh, table format looked like and the green, now we have the new. I won't spend a lot of time, I don't think, um, on, on each item, but you can have a look there to see. Um, I always go to the bottom when you notice potassium in your, uh, in your table, that's an indicator that it's a new table, the new format. And your sugars now, as you can notice there on the right, they've added the uh, percent daily value for total sugars in your food products now. So that's new. So those are just some of the, uh, the items that are new with the, the nutrition facts table. But like I said, if you go to the, uh, that last um, link that shows you all the new changes that are coming. So that's a Health Canada website that I really like to use. And of course, if you do go onto the Canadian Food Inspection Agency website, the industry labeling tool, that is the go-to uh, link for all your labeling, labeling information. It, uh, the first part of it has the core requirements, which I understand most of you have the basic uh, labeling information, some knowledge in there. And then it goes into more specific um, labeling information for claims and statements. And if you go down to the bottom of that page, of that tool, the, the first page, it goes into more specific labeling for meat products or for alcohol. There's honey. So it goes into your more specific uh, food commodities. So it's a really good link. That is our go-to for, um, for all labeling questions. So I included this, uh, this uh, checklist. It may be of, of help as a tool for you to keep also handy. Um, the link is there. I've included just the first um, item that's on this checklist. So it's very uh, specific. It goes through, as you already know, you know, the common name, the net quantity, but it breaks it down into greater detail. So this could be a really good tool for you to keep uh, handy when you're going through your your labels to ensure that you've uh, you've not missed anything on your on your product. So getting into claims and statements, there is a section in the industry labeling tool, and I put a few of the um, claims that you might find out in the in the uh, real world out on the the shelves. These are some of the claims that I just pulled out of there uh, to, to show you today. And of course, as I had mentioned, we do enforce the regulations. So if you fall under the Food and Drugs Act, uh, I've included that no person shall sell. I'm not going to label or read it all off to you. Um, we want to make sure your labels are not false and misleading. So it's all accurate what you are selling. So if you're going to make a health claim, there is a section in the industry labeling tool that tells you how to word your health claims. They're very specific and there's criteria you have to meet to be able to make that claim on your label. So you don't want to get caught with a label, um, with a claim that's on there that, um, that isn't permitted. Same with your, your method of production. So we do see the natural, the homemade, artisan made we do see the organics, um, nutrient content, high fiber, for example. So we do see a lot of claims out there. So make sure they are truthful and accurate. The um, one thing I, I was asked to talk a little bit about, and I won't go into great detail, but the pictures and the vignette or logos, there is a section within the industry labeling tool that talks on that. And it, it tells you, um, you know, what you can and cannot do. So, for example, if you have a picture of an apple on your, on your label, but there's no apples in your ingredients at all, uh, you may want to double check to see if you can do that. Chances are you probably can't if there's no, uh, if there's no real apples 
in your food product. So that's just a couple of examples uh, to share with you today. The other uh, claim that we do see a lot of is uh, your allergen-free claims. So you're aware of, um, you know, peanut-free, gluten-free, all those those claims that are out there. Allergens do have to be do have to be declared um, in your list of ingredients. And if you're making a claim that it's an X-free claim, again, we want to make sure that it's um, that it's truthful. So I was given this question: Can we have gluten-free? and produced in a facility that uses nuts, gluten, and dairy on the same label. If uh, I was standing in front of everybody, I'd be asking for a show of hands who thinks it's true or false. I'm just gonna go uh, throw that out there and with the hint, X free claims and a precautionary statement. Keep in mind, precautionary statements are different than may contain statement. So, and the answer is true. However, unfortunately or fortunately, there's always a few more catches to it. So it is possible to have both a gluten-free claim and a produced in a facility that also produce, uh, processes gluten. So the produced in a facility that also processes gluten would be considered a precautionary statement. And then if you read the rest there, I don't know if I have time to, to go through word for word, but it can be done. However you still have to be able to prove that the product is gluten-free at the end of the day. So I've included the, uh, the link there for your allergen-free, your gluten-free, and your cross-contamination statement. So it's very important to have a look at that if you're going to start making those claims on your products. And now moving into some licensing with those new regulations, the Safe Food Foods for Canadians Act and Regulations. So I won't spend a, a lot of time, you know, reading through this screen. But as I mentioned, it's encompassed the uh, the egg regulations, the dairy regulations. They've put it all into one large set. It also includes consumer packaging and labeling. So for your net quantity products, you have to make sure that they um, that they meet the requirements there. So the li licensing is based on the activities you conduct and not based on the type of business that you have. So there is many questions now with, the, uh, with these new regulations. So to start, do you need to be uh, licensed? Do you know if you have to have a license? So at the very top of the page there, underneath that, do you need a license? There's an interactive tool. So if you go onto that link, you can go through a series of, uh, of questions and as you go through the different levels, it tells you what you need and what you may not need. So those interactive tools are really good. They are located uh, on our um, on the CFIA website. So I took a snippet out of um, the intra-provincial trade. So food products that are not leaving Alberta. We will stay to Alberta for now. So do you need a license? If you trade within your own province, if you manufacture, process, treat, preserve grade package label foods that will be sold or consumed within your province or territory. So it says that you may not, or you don't need a license, but if we go back to any of the dairy, the, the egg or the fish products, or even honey, if you need a grade, then that's gonna change, change your scope if you need to be licensed or not. And my other example of do you need a license, I'll stay here for a few more minutes. I had a few more notes on the side. Um, if you're selling cupcakes, make them in Alberta and selling them in Saskatchewan, you're going to have to be licensed. But they may not be, um, the, the additional paperwork that entails uh, being licensed may not be as complicated as if you are doing the meat and the uh, egg program. I think I mentioned that already. All right, so you're gonna to have to go back and check, go through that interactive tool to see if you need a license. So on this, on this page, I included the, uh, the fees for licensing. And I, I put it at the bottom there, it's valid for two years at that cost. But if you are in the dairy, the honey, the more specific commodities, there could be additional fees that you have to pay for those products to leave, to leave the province. All right, so the other 
um, uh, point that I want to talk about is the traceability. So we discussed that uh, if, you're, if your food products don't leave Alberta, do you still have to have traceability under the Safe Food for Canadians Act and regulations? And yes, you do. So this includes the intra-provincial trade of meat products. So all food products sold at all levels of trade and commerce require a traceability. So what does that mean? That, uh, that talks about food products that you're bringing into your facility, keeping track of that movement backwards. And then going forward, if you're a distributor, if you're a supplier, you're pushing that food from your facility to, to another, another group or entity or, or business, then you're going to have to keep records and they're going to have to keep records of the food products coming into their facility. So this is new within the, uh, the traceability uh, of, the, uh, of the regulations. So do you need a traceability program? So this fact sheet can help you... Uh, determine if you do need the traceability program and how it may look. I'm not going to go through word for word there, but you can have a look talking about tracing of the food a step back, uh, forward. But at the end, so if you're a retail store selling to consumers, then you won't have to uh, keep track of, of that last step going to the direct consumer. But it's those foods going backwards that you want to keep track of. And this has to do with recall purposes also. And as you can see, uh, even for uh, food animals slaughtered. So if you're uh, a small or a whatever size farm and you want to start selling some of your ground, your ground meat or your, your meat products from your, from your facility, you'll keep track of the animals that you've sent to slaughter, what you have coming back. Um, and if it's, uh, if you sell it frozen, for example, and you don't have a best before date, then you can use a lock code or a manufacturing date whatever works for you to keep track of the food products, as I said, coming into your facility. And then as it goes out to the direct consumer, you don't have to keep those records. So this is all brand new. Um, and I, as I said, I included that traceability sheet there at the top for you to go and have a look at, uh, at what, what is required. So there is quite a bit of new information when it comes to licensing and the traceability for uh, food products. So here again, I've included the interactive tools for the, uh, for the food license and for the food safety for industry. So in there, there's some, uh, some more uh, tools for you to use if you need a preventative control plan, if you're getting larger and need to start shipping food products outside of Alberta. But for now, uh, have a look at those interactive tools and they will give you a good uh, outline as to what you'll, you may be needing now or in the near future. And uh, this is my last slide. So who to contact if you have questions with the modernization of the, uh, the programs within the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, as it mentioned in my bio, things have changed over the last number of decades. We send industry to ask CFIA. So here's the link onto the page and I've included the phone number and you can give them a call or you can send them a, an email if you have a specific question. Sometimes they'll, they'll put you back to the local office, which would be our main office, which is in Edmonton. I work out of the Red Deer office, but I still look after central Alberta all the way to the Northwest Territories. Um, so this is where you're going to go in the near future, if not now, uh, to, to get additional help. If you can't find the information on the industry labeling tool, then this is the next, the next stop for you. And then if you eventually get my direct phone number, I will give you a call back and then we can discuss in uh, great lengths your labels and the questions that you have. So that wraps up my presentation for today. I hope it answered or maybe will give you some few more questions that you maybe you haven't thought of um, for the future for your label products. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. We are now going to um, send it over to Stuart to uh, to share his information and we are going to hold all questions until the end of, of both presentations. And there you go, Stuart. There we go. Okay, can you hear me all right? You bet. Okay, great. Thank you very much for having me. 
Uh, yeah, so my name is Stuart. I'm a lab scientist at the Food Processing Development Center. We're found in Leduc, Alberta. And uh, as it says on my slide here, I'll be trying to talk about food safety during product development. Oh, advance, there we are. Uh, so my agenda for today is here. Uh, I'll try and touch on each of these topics a little bit. I'm going to focus mostly on number two and number three here uh, about pH and water activity, but we'll uh, try and address each of these topics as we go. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why food safety matters. Uh, of course, everybody wants to have a safe product for their customers, but to reinforce sort of the consequences, um, I've got here a cost pyramid. So this is a concept that is used in many industries. Uh, in the context of food safety, um, prevention is the cost of implementing a food safety plan. This could include planning, time, money, paperwork, ongoing inspection, testing, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, correction is the cost of catching a food safety issue before that product is sold. So that's 10 times more is the, th is the idea anyway, than the uh, cost of pr instituting that program. And then failure. So if you do not have a food safety program and uh, failure is the cost of a food safety incident. At minimum here, we're gonna have a product recall and destruction of the product. Uh, it could be dealing with loss of public trust, loss of future sales. And then if a customer were to get sick or worse, you know, uh, that, that 100 cost figure could be uh, way too low. So all that is to say, you know, building food safety into your product from the start is a great idea, which presumably is why everyone's here today. OK, so first up, temperature control. Um, you know, today I'm going to be talking about food safety specifically, but a lot of these ideas also apply to shelf life and sort of, you know, they fit hand in glove. If you build food safety into your product and processing from the start, you'll be able to maximize the shelf life of your product and maintain safety throughout that shelf life. Um, so temperature control, uh, the most effective method of controlling micro microbial growth that applies to pathogens as well as spoilage organisms. Um, when we talk about temperature, we have four zones, the hot food zone, so 60 degrees and above, that's primarily for food service, cold food zone between zero and four degrees, frozen food below minus 18, and then, then of course the danger zone. So between four and 60 degrees is the temperature where microbes can, uh, are most able to grow, and that's where we want our food products to spend the least amount of time. Uh, so when you're measuring temperature, of course, use a thermometer, no guessing, and make sure you're able to calibrate that thermometer regularly. Uh, and regardless of how your product is being stored, if it's ready to eat, we may need to be cooking to an appropriate internal temperature, uh, which brings me here. So there's a few examples of safe internal cooking temperatures for a few different kinds of meat. Uh, the most important part of this slide is the link at the bottom there. That'll take you to a Health Canada safety resource that has a lot more information that I could fit on here. Uh, uh, talks about using a thermometer, gives detailed uh, cook temperature charts for all different kinds of categories, as well as for doneness. You know, if you want to cook something to a medium rare versus a well done. And it also talks about cleaning, food prep, and more. So it's a really great place if you're if you need some more information in this area. Next, pH. Um, this is an extremely important parameter for many different shelf-stable foods in particular, uh, dressings, salsas, sauces, even some beverages. A shelf-stable food is what it sounds like, a product that doesn't require refrigeration or freezing, but can be stored at room temperature or on the shelf in a retail setting. I'll talk a little bit more as we go, but the closer the pH is to neutral, the more extreme processing is needed to, um, in terms of temperature, time, or pressure to eliminate microbes uh, because of a more conducive environment. So what is pH? Uh, it stands for potential hydrogen, and it's the concentration of hydrogen ions as compared to distilled water. So the pH scale describes the degree to which a solution is acidic or alkaline or basic, and it's a logarithmic scale, uh, a log 10, meaning that each step along the scale is 10 times more or less acidic than the one before. So seven is neutral, Six is 10 times more acidic than seven. Five is 10 times more acidic than six, and so on. So why does pH matter? Well, uh, microbes can only grow in certain pH ranges. Unfortunately, that's generally the same range uh, that we have our foods at, so somewhere between three and eight, typically. Um, different microbes have different growth ranges, and there are different pHs that we target for controlling the growth of pathogens versus spoilage organisms. 
a pathogen is basically any organism that can cause disease, while a spoilage organism, uh, it'll make food go bad or reduce its quality without necessarily causing disease or illness. So uh, regarding pH, the pathogen that we're uh, most concerned about is probably uh, Clostridium botulinum, which is the organism that causes botulism. So the canning industry is essentially built around Clostridium and pH 4.6, which we'll talk a little bit more about here. Um, so botulism is a very rare but potentially fatal paralytic foodborne illness. It's caused by a neurotoxin. So the organism is an anaerobe, meaning it grows in the absence of oxygen, such as inside a soup can or whatever or a variety of different food products. Um, and the problem or the what makes it so difficult to deal with it is that it produces heat resistant spores. Uh, and these spores are not destroyed by standard cooking. Uh, and the spores in turn produce the toxin that causes the, the issue here. So the canning industry is designed to com combat this by heating under pressure. So using temperature and pressure together, it's sufficient to destroy the spores and thereby eliminate the threat. Uh, now, as we know, not every food needs to be canned, and that's because uh, Clostridium doesn't grow below pH 4.6. So it doesn't grow and it doesn't produce spores. Therefore, high acid foods or foods with a pH below 4.6 do not need pressure canning. Uh, there are other considerations in terms of spoilage organisms, but a pH of 4.6 is very important because you can just use heat to safely um, process your food. I have uh, Nicholas Appert here. Uh, he's often called the father of food science uh, to talk about how this sort of process, food processing got started. Just uh, real quick, uh, in, in 1795, Napoleon offered a 12,000 franc reward for an inventor to find a cheap and effective way of preserving, fo preserving food for his armies. Uh, Appert won that prize later in 1810, essentially by inventing canning. Uh, he showed that cooked food inside of a sealed jar did not spoil. Uh, it was not clear why that was the case until about 50 years later, uh, when Louis Pasteur came along. Uh, Louis Pasteur is the father of microbiology. He disproved the doctrine of spontaneous generation and uh, provided the germ theory of disease. So in addition to this and working on the principles of vaccination, he also came up with what we now call pasteurization. So this is not the same as sterilization. Pasteurization is a process where we eliminate all the pathogens in a product and extend the shelf life by reducing the spoilage. So we don't fully eliminate spoilage, but we reduce it such that we have a, a shelf life we can live with essentially. So Pasteur was a big wine connoisseur. He was showing his work primarily in wine. Uh, he showed that if it was heated between 50 and 60 Celsius, it could kill the dangerous microbes. Um, but the wine could still subsequently be aged without a sacrifice in quality. So I'll talk about now how, um, how pH and temperature can work together for a shelf-stable food. Uh, so in this category, high acid hot fill is one of the first things that comes to mind. This is a pasteurization process that is used for a lot of different cooked products. Again, uh, sauces, salsas, beverages. Uh, the main requirement, as I mentioned, is a pH below 4.6. And at this point, we can just use heat. Uh, so the lower the pH, the less time and temperature is required to get the same uh, degree of pasteurization. Uh, and this is what we would call a multi-hurdle approach to microbial control. So the general procedure for a product of this type is, you know, get all your ingredients mixed together and then heat it up and hold them at the temperature uh, prescribed by a table, which is on the next slide. Fill, fill your product hot into the packaging above 80 Celsius, put your cap on there, and then invert it. Uh, the point of inverting it is so that hot product uh, pasteurizes the headspace of the container or touches every part of your packaging. So the heat of the product itself is providing pasteurization against anything that might have been in your package when the product was put into it. After that, you can flip back and let your product cool. So um, here we have this table gives some general pasteurization time temperature combinations based on the pH of a product. We've got uh, temperature on the left hand side various pH ranges along the top, and then time in minutes required for pasteurization in the body of the table. Um, the, these conditions might be a little bit of overkill, um, but when giving advice in a setting like this, you know, better safe than sorry is really the only way I can go. So these are conservative numbers. Um, you know, I don't know what product everybody's working with, so hopefully these will be, well, these should be sufficient regardless of the product type. Um, I'll say, so the, the numbers presented in this table were reviewed by uh, the CFIA some time ago. 
Uh, it hasn't been looked at recently, so these should be considered general guidelines, but um, as I say, they're conservative numbers and should be pretty good. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is equilibrium pH. So especially for products with large particles or chunks, like a, a chunky salsa or pickles even, uh, the pH you take sort of right as you've mixed all your ingredients together might not be your final pH. Sometimes it takes a few hours or even a number of days to stabilize. So if you're working with something like that, make sure you're checking pH not only you know, during production, but a little while later to see if you've got a consistent number. Uh, okay, so high acid hot fill is one processing technique, uh, but it's not appropriate for every product or for every packaging type. Here we have some pH targets for cold filling. Uh, the next slide I have will provide some links that provide the information that I've referenced here. Um, cold filling still requires heat pasteurization. It's just, as the name suggests, the product can be cooled prior to filling into your packaging. So you don't need packaging that can withstand 80 Celsius. Uh, so cold fill has a lower pH uh, requirement than hot filling. And this is because we don't have the hot product going into our, our packaging to, to be providing pasteurization. So we need a low pH to prevent growth. Uh, to go along with the low pH, it's also recommended that there's a six day hold time prior to distribution if you're doing a cold filled product. The idea here being, uh, you know, by six days, you're gonna see growth if something has gone wrong. So I, you know, have your six day hold time. And then I recommend, you know, minimum inspection and possibly some testing prior to uh, selling or distri distributing your product if you're doing a cold fill. Um, you will see some products on the market that are essentially mix and fill that can even be sold, sold as shelf stable. So it is possible to do this safely, but I would be very aware of it. It's a, a, a risky endeavor, I guess I would say, especially for shelf stable. If it's going to be a refrigerated product, that could be a different story, but uh, pasteurization is um, <laughs> really a good idea if your product can, can handle it. Uh, speaking of refrigerated or frozen products, uh, I don't have any exact pH targets for this, but pH can still be an effective tool for shelf life extension in a refrigerated product, uh, working again as one hurdle in a multi-hurdle um, approach to preventing microbial growth. Here are the links uh, I mentioned. The first link is for ingredients that can be used to reduce pH. So maybe you've got lemon juice or vinegar or something, but that's not quite getting the job done. There are a number of food grade acidulants that are permitted, uh, all available on that link there. The rest of the links are for information about the different processes needed for the different pH categories I've been talking about. The high acid hot fill and the cold fill guidelines come from the University of Wisconsin, who were brave enough to publish this kind of generalized advice. Uh, it's great. I recommend everyone interested in this area have a look at these PDFs. Uh, sadly, the temperatures are, of course, in Fahrenheit, so you'll have to convert them if you want to be dealing with a reasonable temperature scale, but the information is great. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is refrigerate after opening is your friend, that statement. Um, you know, if you've been developing your product, you've done everything right, you've got a great hot fill process. Uh, as soon as somebody opens your product and sticks their spoon in there to take some out, it could potentially be contaminated. So in order to maintain that product quality, once your customer has uh, got their hands on it, refrigerate after opening. <laughs> okay, a short diversion here to talk about how pH, uh, how measuring pH works. A pH meter is essentially a voltmeter. Um, at the beginning of the section, I had a chart that showed that low pH has a high hydrogen ion concentration. Uh, hydrogen ions, denoted H+, of course, have a positive charge. So a pH probe contains two electrodes within a selective, selectively permeable tip. Uh, the internal electrode measures the sample, and the reference electrode compares the sample against the calibration standard. By interacting only with the hydrogen ion, ions, an electrochemical charge is registered by the pH meter in millivolts, which is correlated to a pH value. So the internal solution uh, is a buffer, usually pH 7, it has a fixed activity. This is uh, doesn't need to be refilled. The reference solution is usually silver chloride or potassium chloride, and in some probes can be refilled or recharged to keep your pH probe working, uh, working well, maintaining its responsiveness for a long period of time. Some electrodes are also kind of a low maintenance probe. They're not refillable. They have a gel solution instead. Uh, this doesn't require replacing, but the probe also will not have as long of a life lifespan. Um, if pH is gonna be important to the product you're developing, you may consider purchasing a pH meter. There are a ton of pH meters on the market. 
and they vary considerably. Uh, you know, a really nice lab bench unit could go for five thousand dollars. You can also get a pH pen on Amazon for like fifty bucks. So I can't tell you exactly what's best for you, um, but I can talk a few things to consider. Calibration. Um, a two-point calibration is required. Definitely don't buy anything that can't be calibrated. Three-point is better. And when you're doing a calibration, the instrument should give you a percent slope value. Just for reference, between 90 and 102% slope is, is the acceptable range. And outside of that requires uh, either some maintenance or recalibration. Range, um, almost every meter will measure the entire range from zero to 14, but double check that uh, the pH range is what you need for the product that you're working with. Sensitivity, uh, two decimal places more than likely is fine. If you're operating very close to a pH cutoff, say you're formulated to be 4.5 and you're really you're taking a risk there, but um, you may consider a third decimal, but probably that's just for R and uh, for, you know, if you're publishing results. Um, so pH meters, there's a lot of different kinds of probes or electrodes. Some probes are better for different types of products. Uh, a bulb probe is probably best for solution maybe a bulb with a guard if you have kind of a chunky sauce. A spear is great for meat products. Something flat might be good for gummies. And then electrode type, as I talked about, the gel, uh, refillable, cheap, disposable. Oh, there's a gel is non-refillable, rather, is cheap uh, and disposable. And the refillable might cost more. It does require maintenance, but you can keep it lasting uh, essentially forever if you uh, take care of it. Okay, that's it for pH. So water activity. Uh, water activity is not quite the same as moisture. Um, in, rather, it's related, but rather it's measured from zero to one, and it's a measure of bound versus free water. So unbound or, or free water is available for biological activity and chemical reactions. Uh, and so water activity is an energy state of, of water in a product. Bound water having a lower energy state than free water, and so we can measure that difference by the vapor pressure uh, of, of a product. The graph on the right here is called a, um, a moisture sorption isotherm, uh, which isn't <laughs> too important, but it describes how water activity relates to spoilage, both by chemical reactions as well as microbial growth. Uh, the microbe region that we're most worried about is the uh, high water activity region, kind of above 0.7. Um, most foods do have high water activity, so water activity isn't something you can use as a fix-all for every product, but uh, it is one thing to consider. So why does it matter? Um, it's a critical factor in determining the safety and quality of foods. Uh, it works along with temperature and pH to moderate or to modulate if or how fast a microbe can grow. So it's important for safety shelf life as well as the texture, flavor, and smell of your product. So this table here shows examples of some organisms that can grow at different water activities. Uh, below 0 0.6 water activity is what we would consider shelf stable. So nothing really will grow below 0 0.6. Um, the water activity of a product can be reduced by adding solids, so salts or sugars, or by drying or removing moisture from a product, or of course a combination of both. Here I have a few more targets uh, for water activity for different product types. You can see as we go down, we, we're starting to get a longer and longer shelf life. So from fresh, fresh fish and milk at the top to evaporated milk, uh, sweetened condensed milk, fermented sausage, dried fruits, flowers, cereals, and finally, so below 0 0.6 is our shelf stable category, chocolate, honey, potato chips, et cetera. Um, so that would be shelf stable. It's not gonna spoil more than likely. That doesn't mean it lasts forever. Uh, it's kind of a different discussion, but there are still chemical reactions, particularly oxidation that can occur at very low water activities. These generally would lead to quality rather than safety issues, but um, so it's just to say it's shelf stable, but it's still, it's not nothing lasts forever, I guess. So how do we measure water activity uh, with the water activity meter? Uh, as I mentioned, this works by comparing vapor pressures. Um, so the vapor pressure of the pr product against pressure of pure water at room temperature. Unbound water is equal to that of pure water. And then any interactions that are reducing the water activity of your product are also reducing the energy of the water. And so we're able to measure that with the meter. So here with water activity, we see how food safety is closely linked with shelf life and uh, water activity can actually help you to set your shelf life in some cases. Uh, and it's important not just for safety, but also economically. You know, you don't want to be removing expired product that is actually still good or vice versa, selling product that you say is unexpired, but has actually gone bad. So 
important to get that shelf life correct. I mean, that's an essential part of your food safety. Um, if you're looking to purchase a water activity meter, probably not something you'll do during the development process, but as you're moving into large scale food production, you might want to look into it. Same thing as pH meters, there's lots of options out there. Um, same kind of criteria to consider. You want to get something that you can calibrate. You want to have, be able to calibrate with two different standards, ideally above and below your target water activity. In the case of water activity meters, the standards are uh, specialized salt solutions. The range, I'm not aware of a meter that doesn't go the whole range, but make sure. Uh, sensitivity, same thing, uh, two decimal places, maybe three is more than likely fine. Uh, for water activity meters, sample preparation is very important because uh, the surface area plays such a big role in it being able to quickly and you know, effectively measure the vapor pressure. So you need a uniform particle size or surface area. So if you're working with the powder already, that's not, not much prep is needed, but if it's a larger product, you need to be cutting that up into uniform particles. Typically, we would recommend about two millimeter cubes. Okay, um, preservatives, a dirty word. <laughs> no, <laughs> they are not. Uh, it's of course very popular to have a clean label, no additives, no preservative added, no preservatives added, excuse me. Uh, but I assure you, uh, if used appropriately, preservatives are a safe and effective tool, not only for food safety, but also for shelf life extension. Uh, preservatives and chemical preservatives can be used to slow spoilage caused by chemical changes as well as microbial growth. So as we've been talked about, as we have been talking about the supplies to safety and shelf extension, so on this uh, first uh, dot, first bullet here, salt, ascorbic acid, wood smoke, these are examples of preservatives that maybe you'd be okay with on your label. Uh, next one down, sodium nitrate or nitrite, sorbic acid, benzoic acid. Maybe you, you think twice before those, but they're all preservatives, they're all regulated, and they're all safe to use. The link here is your one-stop shop. It is full of great information. It has all permitted preservatives. Um, they're divided into four classes, and it gives you which food products each additive is allowed in. It gives you the maximum level of use, and there's also some guidance about if you're using multiple preservatives in combination. So again, uh, maybe not the most popular method, but not a dirty word, and definitely <laughs> a great option if you need it. Record keeping. Um, Carol already talked to us a little bit about traceability, uh, so this will be maybe a bit of a review, but you know, we've spent time, we've developed a really great new product. Food safety has been an integral part of our process. But what happens if we're asked to prove it? Well, we need that traceability, as Carol was mentioning. So keeping records of your production is essential. And really, it's never too soon to get a good record keeping system in place. There are many types of records that might be appropriate for a particular operation, uh, formulation records, CCP, shipping, receiving, SOPs, training records, organic records, natural health product records, uh, types of information. Definitely, you're going to need company name, product name, the date, a lot number. You may also have, you know, a target measurement versus an actual measurement, name of the operator, name of the supervisor or verifier, signatures, uh, time something was done. The point of all, all this is what are you going to do if there is a food, a food recall is required? You need to be able to track every ingredient that comes in to your uh, your facility through production and through shipping. So, you know, if there's a recall, do you know where you sold lot ABC123? I have a few acronyms here. CCP is critical control point. Um, it's a control that's essential to prevent a food safety hazard or at least to reduce it to an acceptable level of risk. Some examples, uh, cooking, cooling, container inspection, or what we've been talking about, you know, meeting your pH target or your water activity. And then SOP, uh, which is just standard operating procedure, is a document that describes, you know, how to do a certain procedure, such as measuring pH, for example. The point of SOPs and of training records, for that matter, is to make sure you're doing the same thing the same way every time. And then that way you want to be ensuring consistency, quality, and safety. So, you know, it's your, you're making your own product, your already an expert in your field, maybe it's not important, but hopefully all of your businesses here are growing. You're hiring people to do some of the work for you. And at that point, it's important to document your SOPs and your training. Here I have uh, just a fake formulation record here on the left that I made. 
just to give an example, it's got company name, product name, date, lot number. It has my package size, uh, my number of packages that I'm making, and then what batch size I need to get there. I've got my ingredients, I've got my supplier. One thing I'm missing here, I may want to include the lot number of all my ingredients that come from my suppliers. I may want to include that on this record. I've got the percentage in my formulation and then the amount that I'm to be adding to make this batch. What's blank there is the amount that I've actually added and then the initial of the person who's doing the adding. Uh, at the bottom, I also have the procedure that I'm using to make this, um, this batch of product. To go along with this, I'm probably going to need an inventory record, pasteurization record, pH record, and then shipping records to go along with what I've got here. All of those records will be using the same conventions and codes, allowing for easy traceability from start to finish of my whole production process. Um, on the right, a uh, uh, CCP record, this particular one is for meat product cooking and cooling. You know, of course we think of cooking as a CCP, that's obvious, but cooling is just as important. We talked about the danger, zo danger zone for food temperature. We need to get through that as quickly as possible. And for some products, meat in particular, there are requirements. You know, you have to be below a certain temperature within a certain amount of time from cooking. And this record can help to document all that. Uh, purchasing lab instruments. So if you need to purchase something or you need to purchase lab supplies, like a calibration standard, where can you go? There are a number of lab supply companies. These are listed by alphabetical order. I'm sure they're all equally great. There are many others, particularly for specialized chemical reagents or uh, equipment or procedures. A lot of times, if you're looking for an actual instrument, you can get it direct from a manufacturer, or these days you can just about buy anything online, Amazon or your website of choice. And sort of when you're shopping around, consider the stuff we've talked about. Uh, price, of course, the calibration, does it come with standards? What is the range and sensitivity of the instrument? The precision, the precision and accuracy. What types of samples can it accommodate? And is that the type of product that you are making? Uh, what sample prep is required? And then a balance of, okay, is there a lot of maintenance required with this instrument, or is there a cheap, uh, cheaper option that you know is easy to use, but I'll have to replace every three or four months? So somehow consider all of that together and. Uh, purchase whatever works best for your process. Uh, private testing. So our lab's not able to offer commercial testing services, uh, but this link here uh, has a listing of labs that do. As with any listing, it's not all encompassing. There's certainly others, Google, call around, shop to find what'll work best. You can find all types of different private analytical testing, um, microbial testing, pH, water activity, also nutritional analysis or nutrition facts panel help. Uh, you know, just about anything. Uh, I had their method accreditation. Uh, an accredited method is best for standardization, technical competence, and accuracy. You're, you're typically going to get a nice certificate of, al of analysis. Um, it may not always be necessary, though. You know, if you're still in the development process, say you just need to know the pH of three different formulations that you're thinking about, um, you know, an accredited method is nice, but maybe not necessary. And that just about brings me to the end. Um, I hope some of this information has been useful. The truth is every product is different. Food safety is multifactorial, so general advice can be a little bit tricky, but hopefully the information today is at least a, a sort of a tool in your toolbox and will help you evaluate your individual products and your processes to uh, build in as much food safety as you can uh, right off the bat. Uh, so that's all for me. Thank you very much, and I think Carol and I would be happy to take any questions um, if there are any. Thank you, Stuart. This is Eileen Katovich. I work with Stuart and have worked with Carol over the years many times as well and helped to uh, bring this webinar together. So yes, if you do have questions, please type them into the Q&A and you should find that at the top of your screen um, as a little icon. With the Q&A and the question mark symbol. So please type any questions in. Um, I just want to say thank you, Stuart and Carol. Always informative. Lots of information there um, and a lot to take in. We will share both of their presentations in an email afterwards, so you'll get the links and, and know how to access some of the information that they have put in there.
Anything, um, Stuart and Carol, that any sort of fast tips that you would like to share with people if they're kind of not sure where to get started on on things? Is it go to the websites? Where do they? Where do? What's the best place for people to start looking for the information that you've shared? If they're looking for equipment or they're looking for labeling. Where should they go? As far as labeling, go to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency website and look for the industry labeling tool. That tool should have all the information if you can navigate through it, which it can be a little bit confusing. Um, but yeah, go through the industry labeling tool. That will get you going with your labels. And if you need help, go to the Ask, my, Ask CFIA. Give them a call to see if they can uh, help you further. So is there is there anyone once someone uh, once a business has their label designed, is there anybody who can give it a fast once over to make sure they haven't missed something or that they haven't um, stated something incorrectly? Or is it just they they go work through the tool and kind of hope for the best that they haven't missed anything? Yeah, go through the tool, go through the core labeling requirements. At one time, we did do label reviews for industry. The onus is now put back on industry to ensure that they uh, that they put all the accurate information on their label. How do you do that? Go back to the tool, the industry labeling tool, including that checklist. That checklist might be a good um, added piece of information. You can print it off and you can use it when you go through each item of the core requirements. Uh, like for example, the common name which I had posted, uh, what is a common name? How do you find the common name? Is there a standard to that common name? If, is it a vodka, for example? Then there's a standard that has to be met. So that checklist could be a, a very useful tool to also help guide you through the requirements for, for labeling. Uh, we do have one question, um, and I assume this would be for Stuart. Can you comment about when to invite your health inspector to see your process? Oh, um, <laughs> as soon as possible, I guess. Uh, no, I mean, when when you're getting, as soon as you're getting your process dialed in is probably a good time. You know, you ideally would want to be uh, inspected before you've done any sales, right? Just that's a great check to make sure that everything is, is done correctly. So sometime towards the end of product development and bef before you're getting into sewing uh, would be a great time. Thank you. Also mentioned just about the uh, having your labeling. I mean, you can definitely pay somebody to double check it for you. Uh, the, the analytical lab list that I had in my one slide, there's also companies there that will double check your nutritional facts panel. Um, and your labels they're of course charge you for that and as carol mentioned you know they're probably just going through that checklist as well so <laughs> that's your best option but if you do need a double check there are businesses that will help you for a price <laughs> are you aware Stuart, of any um software programs for developing or carol for that matter both either of you for developing nutrition facts panels or is there you know somewhere people can look if they want to do this themselves through a software program. Do you want me to start? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yep. OK, so when industry you know, asks me where where do I go for, for the labeling information, I um, I tell them I've heard from other other industry uh, people. Uh, Bake Flex has been a good uh, computer based program for the bakery industry uh, going online to find out to find those services. Um, can help. That's where where I send them to. And like um, it was mentioned already, the labs, the labs can also uh, can be an assistant also on the industry labeling tool uh, in there in the nutrition labeling. There's the compendium for the nutrition facts tables, not uh, you cannot input your information into those tables, but the, the table templates are there as to what you need, which size you need for your for your product. Thank you. Another, to well, just another software option that I'm aware of is called Genesis. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of different ones out there. Uh, but yeah, they have, they don't have every ingredient, right? But they have, say, a base of 10,000 ingredients in there. And they've got your 
you know, your fat, your protein, your sugar content for each ingredient. So you just type in your particular recipe and it comes up with the, the table for you. But if you're working with something very unique, then, you know, it might not be in there. Here's another one, Nutri Coaster. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, I'm sure that there's a bunch of options. I can add Health Canada has a database for common foods sold in made and sold in Canada. Uh, I use that for the ground beef as, a, as an example. So ground beef across provinces, unless it's you know very unique, is pretty much standardized for the amount of fat content that's in there. And I'll send out that link, uh, and that's in the Health Canada database for common foods. That's a really good link also for nutrient contents of, of some food products sold in Canada. Okay. We don't have any more questions at this point. Just give people a little bit and see if there's any other questions. Um, if not, we'll thank everyone for attending. We will be sending out the um, recording after this is done. This is the this is the first time we've done this as a Teams webinar, so we're just sort of working out the kinks of how we share the recording with you, but we will get that out to everybody who attended as well as those who registered and weren't able to attend, so that will be coming. We will also be sending uh, in the follow-up email uh, an Opinio survey to do an evaluation of this session, so we really do appreciate your feedback and we appreciate if you could fill that in for us and get send that back to us thank you no more questions guys so thank you Stuart thank you Carol for great presentations thank you Dolores for doing the behind the scenes stuff as well really appreciate it so thank you everybody have a great day and hopefully we can connect in further and if you do have questions um, when I send out the email I will include information in there for you can send questions through back through us and we will get them to Carol and and Stuart directly if we need to so don't be don't be concerned that we're going to drop you we, we won't we'll make sure you get answers to any of your questions so thank you and have a great day thank you thank you very much bye everybody